and welcome back to my channel. I'm Joy and I'm so glad you stopped by again and today I'm excited to be introducing a reading vlog for this channel. I've never done that before and so I'm hoping that this will be a fun experiment. I've got quite a few books I'm currently sort of dipping into and thinking about and I'm really excited to share them with you all. If you follow me on Instagram you probably have a bit of an idea what I might be reading but I think it's exciting to be able to have the opportunity to talk about those books a little bit more in detail and with more sort of reflections. So if you have any thoughts on any of these books or any recommendations please leave them in the comments below and I um, look forward to taking you along with me on my little journey of reading this week. primarily hoping that this will be a reading vlog sort of recapping my time reading this specific book. I've been reading for a few months now The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky and I'm almost at the end of my reading journey with it. This is a book that I really want to chronicle my experience of um, like my thoughts and my um, impressions of that journey with Dostoevsky's work. I've read one other Dostoevsky novel, The Brothers Karamazov, and that was such an incredible read. I read it in 2020 and that was like at the height of the first lockdowns here in Australia and just spending months with Dostoevsky that year created a strong impression in my mind and this year I was very eager to get back into his work and so I have quite a few of his books collected now. I have Crime and Punishment, The Devils, Notes from Underground and The Idiot and so I've picked up The Idiot and I'm almost done. So I'm page 668 and it's about seven, my edition has about 718 pages. Really near the end. I hope you join me along on this adventure of sort of going through Dostoevsky's work and this will probably be one of many videos in which I cover his work as I kind of still got quite a few of his works still to read. I hope you enjoy. <laughs>
So I guess the biggest update for this week is that I finished reading The Idiot by Fyodor Dostoevsky. I finished it. I started reading this um, probably... When did I start reading this? It's definitely taken me less time to read than when I was reading The Brothers Karamazov, but that's probably understandable. Brothers Karamazov is like over a thousand pages long, and so this is just a shorter book, but by saying short, it's like 700 pages, so it's not particularly tiny either. But I absolutely loved reading The Idiot. It's such a complex work, and my thoughts on it are still kind of developing and expanding as I think about it more. And I think that it's the kind of book I'd love to reread at a certain point and sort of really untangle and wrestle with because I feel like there's so many facets and themes and aspects of the story that can be explored in greater detail. The Idiot is in a way a more flawed and less cohesive work than maybe Brothers Karamazov was. Brothers Karamazov is honestly probably Dostoevsky's crowning achievement. I guess it's only fair to say that anything else would kind of pale by comparison, but I honestly, that was like my idea of what it would be, would be, it wouldn't be as good. And that still like, holds true to Brothers Karamazov is the best of the two I've read so far, but the it is by no means a work that we can dismiss. It's actually such a profound work as well. And I might have even had more fun with this book. Like I think the other one had a deeper impact on me emotionally and spiritually. Its scope was so much greater, but this one was just so interesting. It was so unusual and I don't feel like I've read anything like this story ever. The Idiot, just to give you kind of a little recap of the premise of the story, it's about this guy returning from a sanatorium in Switzerland to St. Petersburg and he's known as the Idiot. His name is Prince Mishkin and he pays a visit to his distant relatives, the General Yipanchen and his family kind of charms them and he gets to know their family. General Yipanchen has three daughters, he and his wife, and they're all, I guess, eligible. Basically, there's a whole bunch of different narratives and things that are unfolding. And the main kind of exciting thing is that you have very early on the question of whether he is an idiot, a truly an idiot, or is it just a perception of him or is how he wants to be seen. It's something that he definitely doesn't seem to be embracing as an identity in the beginning. He's, he's quite a grounded character in the beginning uh, and very uh, gentle and uh, sensitive person. And I, I just loved him from the first introduction. Prince Michigan was very a tender soul and I kind of loved that. I think what I love was that there's so much complexity with Prince Michigan's character that I didn't stay in that sort of zone throughout the whole book. I think he's a much more complicated character and so I've been thinking about that a lot. But anyway, that's the main premise. Prince Michigan who comes back to St. Petersburg and with his uh, visiting General Yupanchen and his daughters and basically just gets into back into Russian society um, just like in the that sort of circle of uh, elite rich people. One of the main specific kind of interactions or things like really stand out is he's he kind of on the train journey towards St. Petersburg he meets this guy called Rogozhin and Rogozhin is very I guess he's a very intense kind of person he seems very broody very driven by something, an obsession. And he shows Prince Mishkin on the train journey and he talks about this a photograph of this particular woman, this young lady. Um, her name is Nastasia Philippe. And Nastasia Philippe is an interesting character in herself because she's kind of haunts the whole narrative of the idiot. She haunts the main character, Prince Mishkin, and Magorjan, who turns out to be this sort of main rival uh, competition. I guess to Prince Mishkin. But then there's a whole slew of different characters and uh, some of them have a very tenuous relationship with the main plot. Some of them are just kind of interesting rather side characters who seem to have their own little philosophical journeys to go on. You have characters like Hippolyte who I found very tragic and I was very drawn to his passages. Um, and yeah you just have all these adventures and basically Prince Mishkin meeting Nastasi Philippe really has pity on her character because she is, I guess, known in the city and she's regarded and viewed as a fallen woman, a woman who's and someone who's an outcast in society, someone who's been discarded and mistreated. It's what other people say of her that makes her believe herself to be this tragic fallen character. Mishkin, I feel, has this idealized vision of her 
um, her suffering and he sees a photograph of her and all he sees is her pain and suffering and I think that was very profound just like how a character is introduced is through a photograph and it's sort of the impression of a photograph as on the whole story it's just yeah it was really interesting one of the characters that really also stood out was Aglaya she's uh, General Yupanchen's daughter and there's a bit of a love triangle going around um, multiple sort of cross intersections of suitors across the narrative. Prince Mishkin is someone who suffers from epilepsy. He often has this sort of ecstatic spiritual sort of experiences just right before he has an epileptic fit and they're very sort of mystical, very spiritual, like just an observation about the realities of life, just how incredible it is and stuff like that. And I guess that allows him to have sort of a perspective on the world, the sense of the beauty and the goodness of life and how every moment is so valuable and so important. But on the other hand, characters have ob obsessions with the idea of death and suffering. And so it's kind of like those two things are kind of intention. It's interesting because I think Dostoevsky puts in a lot of his biographical experiences into this novel, maybe perhaps more than some of his other works. The other thing that I found really profound actually was just like a very early moment in which Prince Michigan mentions this sort of story he heard about a man who faced the gallows and in those last few moments before his death, just a few moments before he faces execution, he basically is sort of tormented with this idea, what if I had another chance to live my life? What would I do with my life? And this idea that, you know, to live your life with every moment counting and having purpose for Manson because he's like, well, if I could live my life, I would use every moment to the full. And that sort of realization kind of haunts him. This is something that Dostoevsky experienced because he himself was nearly executed and faced this firing squad. So I feel like there is a sense of connection from that. My general impression was this, this novel is very complex with lots of threads to sort of draw on together. Some of my favourite moments in the story were the moments with Prince Mishkin and in tension with um, Rogorjan. Those moments, Dostoevsky draws out so much tension and, and it, it's suspense and you just like want to know what happens and the characterization of Rogorjan is very fascinating because he's like always victor through like people seeing him in a distance or thinking they've seen him and they spy on him. Uh, I saw uh, Rogorjan but they don't know for sure and all that Prince Michigan sees is some, like, sometimes like the gaze of some eyes looking out at him from the train station or something through the mist or through a clouded murky alley and so he's kind of spooked out because he's just like oh did I see him did I not did I imagine this was it just a dream is a part of one of my hallucinations from my epilepsy and so he's kind of like haunted by that and so there's a very strong gothic grotesque undertone to this novel and I found the moments with Rogorjan characters like Nastasi Philippe and in many ways even Prince Mishkin but particularly those two characters felt very gothic psychological one of my favorite moments in the story I don't want to spoil it but it's just a really profound interaction between Rogorjan and Prince Mishkin Rogorjan has this random painting in his house. It's very strange that he would have in his very spooky house. It's like a bit of haunted place. Uh, I, in my opinion, it felt haunted. <laughs> and he was just, he had this painting of, uh, by Holbein um, for the crucified Christ. In, and it's very sort of devastating. It's a very intense portrait. And it's um, it has a profound effect, an impact on both characters. The response to this painting is one that is both full of fear and um, pain seeing that like a sense of hopelessness almost and then there's sort of having this discussion about resurrection and faith and how faith is such an important part of Russian the Russian spirit and I think it was very interesting that interaction was just like unusual for me to see it happening between those two characters. I just didn't imagine that. And um, I've been thinking a lot about the idea of Christ with suffering. And because Prince Mishkin kind of has this image of being the, a really truly good character. He's the most noble and pure person that Nastasi Philippe knows. She even says that and trusts him for it. Nastasi Philippe has sort of conflicted because in 
Prince Michigan's eyes, he, he sees her as a noble figure. He keeps on describing her as a mad woman, but he sees her as someone to be pitied. And she kind of can't accept that love, can't accept that pity. I think it's interesting, there's like almost two forms of love in the novel. And there's like the human jealous love, the one that we kind of see represented in characters like the Goliath and I guess the Gorgian in many ways. And then we have a character like Prince Michigan who's like, he's caught up in this tension between the idealized idea of beauty and goodness and truth. And, and he wants to love in, the, in an ideal way. And then sort of less romantic idea, I guess, of human experience and how does one love in this broken world. So, so many profound ideas in this story. I'm rambling endlessly, but things that I that definitely left an impression on me was the depiction of suffering and the depiction of beauty, depiction of the two kinds of love that might exist and how, you know, there is an ideal. Dostoevsky was trying to kind of present this portrait of a truly beautiful soul and how that might meet a very corrupted, materialistic and sordid sort of society which he depicts in the Russian society he uh, characterizes in the novel and Prince Mishkin's sort of it's kind of an abstract character just thrown into that novel and you feel like he doesn't have a context or a background he's kind of just left there to sort of flounder within that world and yet you feel like he, there's no roots to his character whereas you have all these kind of much more grounded nitty-gritty characters that he's surrounded by and it's kind of a question of those two, like the spiritual and the material world, I feel like are kind of colliding in some ways. It was, in a way, I think a slightly unfulfilled idea. Dostoevsky apparently didn't think he kind of achieved that idea. Um, and I can see that. It's a bit messy. It's a bit like hard to sort of understand what Dostoevsky's kind of conclusions are. But I think that's the joy of it. It's so much more to wrestle and grapple with. I think it's just, it's really rich because it has this sort of questions that you kind of have to think through wrestle with and ask yourself about. So I've definitely loved my experience reading Dostoevsky's The Idiot. I tabbed throughout the book and annotated it in the margins, just put my thoughts in. And I found that was a really profound experience. I really enjoyed sort of engaging with the work in a much more personal and tangible way. I felt very connected to my reading of this novel and I felt like I was having a conversation with Dostoevsky over the story. Something that I was sort of like really interested in is the image of suffering. So in photograph of Nastasia Philippe, we have this image of suffering which Mishkin kind of recognizes and is moved by. But it's kind of a question that kind of haunts the, the story, I feel, is, is suffering necessary as a part of the experience of um, uh, trials of the soul and how does a character sort of live in this, this world. As I was getting in the second half of the book, I noticed that in many ways the character of the prince, as he becomes more idealist in his ideal He's almost like becomes more detached from reality. So the character of the prince becomes more abstract in a way. His love becomes more abstract. His ideas do not meet the expectations of society. And in that, there is a sense in which he almost feels like the idiot, right? He becomes very naive in his choices, or he doesn't become so, but it becomes more apparent that his very strong convictions are so at odds with the sort of expectations of how one should conduct themselves within people who are from society. The, a statement that's thrown at Prince Michigan, it's like, oh, you don't understand the real world. And it's like, is it that he doesn't understand the real world or he envisions another reality, another way of being and another way of seeing the world and in the brokenness and, and the messiness of things, he's he's holds on to that purity and goodness when everything else is so, is saying something else. And I think that was interesting to kind of consider because Prince Michigan does have this naivety that you kind of wish was true, but you're like, can there be a practical way of this love, ideal love, be sort of carried out without having these devastating, this tragic outcome? Um, and I won't spoil what happens, but yeah, definitely some really dramatic scenes. And the question, what is love? What is fitting? What's the difference between the two? I think is really like drawn out and I found it really fascinating. I think the ending just was so, so powerful, very haunting. I did not expect it to go out the way it did, but it also made a lot of sense and I was very interested that the story went down the way it did. I really absolutely loved the idea. I highly recommend it. I also was really encouraged to read 
bit alongside some other works about Dostoevsky and about Dostoevsky's writing. I've been reading, sort of to complement it, I've been reading the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams' book, um, Dostoevsky. This book has been really profound and helpful in examining the sort of theological implications of Dostoevsky's writing. And in his reflections on the idiot, there were some, a lot of those ideas about this abstract versus an ideal love and just things that made me really think about the book in a way that I hadn't considered before. And I, I found it very spiritually edifying and spiritually forming and encouraging me. It's a dense work, so you kind of have to read it in a slower pace, but I found it really helped kind of enlighten, bring to life this work from a sort of theological or Christian perspective. And I absolutely love that. These are all my thoughts for The Idiot. And I'm really excited to read more Dostoevsky in the future. I would love to hear what your thoughts are. If you've read any Dostoevsky novels, please let me know. But I definitely highly recommend this reading. Thank you so much for watching this vlog and I hope you're having a lovely day or evening whatever time you're watching this um, in your week in your part of your life I'm so grateful that you stopped by thank you for the lovely comments I've received in my previous video that have been so supportive for me starting this channel it's been a really exciting new thing and I'm really um, grateful for all your support so I hope you um, stay tuned for my next video and thank you so much for your support and happy reading enjoy the reading life be blessed and I'll see you all next time bye